also this is going to be rendered out not just in true side view, this is going to be rendered out in front view to make sure that the knees are not wobbling somewhere off in a crazy way in order to try to cheat a particular picture. The knees have to be stay in, stay in a fluid line throughout the movement. So this is something that is a work in progress and it's showing uh, what I'm doing with it and it shows that in order to really get it right you need to take a lot of frames all the way through, not just one or two. So this is a work in progress, but it's coming along very well and it's proving quite interesting. Now we'll go to the next. I know we're getting short on that. Now this is another something that I've been working on on the film. This is where you take one frame of film, you put it in Photoshop, you take the very next frame in the sequence, you invert the colors and you set it at a 50% transparency, and then you align the two so the landscapes line up perfectly. When you do that, all of the landscapes, which are the same in those two frames, turn neutral gray. Anything that's black is what was on the underlying frame. Anything that is white is what is in the next frame only. And what this does is allows us to actually see motion. What we're seeing here in the black is what changed from the back going forward. What we're seeing in the front is what the next frame moving forward is. The white outline that you see around each one of those frames is how much it has moved forward in that particular frame. So this is actually allowing me to do a motion analysis so I can actually study more about the actual motion frame by frame by frame. And you can see it much more clearly this way. Like what I was mentioning about the wrist on the hand. The wrist is up here. You see it in white. That's the second position it's moved into. And suddenly over here you see the wrist is bent inward, almost like a golf club. That's that swinging of the wrist very, very loosely. It's occurring. If you were just looking at it with normal coloration, frame by frame, you might have missed things like that. But this is part of the current research that I'm doing as well on motion analysis using this particular technique of superimposing two pictures. But again, I'm having to take it through frame after frame after frame. One frame simply is not enough. You need to do it more or less. This shows the same thing of a motion analysis. One frame overlaid with one quite a bit further down. And the point of this particular one was to identify the angle of the leg here, the angle of the leg here, to find out where the foot is. If the foot's slightly obscured, you can't see it, you're not sure how far down is the foot. But basically, these two legs tapering to one fixed point give you an exact position for your ankle. That gives you an exact position of the foot, which allows you then to scale the foot and an overlay of the body. So those are some of the things involved in that particular study, which is ongoing next to um, oh, I wish you could see this better. There is one dispute about the film. Some people, it is described that the film at the end runs out. Roger literally ran out of film while he was filming. There are some people who dispute this. Okay. When you have a camera run out, and then you take the film out of the camera, and if you don't do it in a true dark room that's absolutely black, the light exposes the outermost strip of film around this open daylight core. But what it does also is that it exposes light through the sprocket holes into the next layer where there's still a picture. Now, in this particular one, there's an orangish burn-in right here. And then there's an orangish burn-in right here again and again. These are the burn-ins of the sprocket where light is passed through from the layer above, burning into that and making it orange. This only occurs on the camera run-out. Uh, the next one I think we'll also show you. Yeah. Oh boy, I wish you could see this one better. Um, what we have here again is this technique of taking two frames, reversing one in color, setting it at half transparency, and uh, superimposing it over the other one. Uh, this is a couple of frames further in the film where there is no exposure of light from a run out. But on this particular one, which is actually the last frame of the film, this area here, it's in orange, and then in another one, it was overlaid a bluish tone. These are the sprocket hole burn ends, the orange being the underneath layer, the true color, and the blue, which is the opposite on the second one I put above, both of them up in here, showing the sprocket area. But there's also an orange cast. I don't know how well you can see it, but there's an orange cast coming in here. And that's when you actually open up your camera, like Roger used. And you have your daylight spool, which is a solid black spool, but a little bit of film is on the edge. And if the film is not real tight, it's a little bit loose, and the last roll out, 
some light sneaks in back past that last roll over the top and exposes a little bit of the next layer only on the edge opposite the sprockets. And there's an orangish tint. This is on the last frame or two of the film. There's an orangish tint in here and it goes back to normal color. And it's this orangish tint which is also part of the burning. Now these things I will be presenting in the future in a better form where the visual is much more distinct, uh, where we can actually see uh, the evidence of those things. But that particular thing is one area of my investigation also where I have come to uh, conclude that there is no question in our minds that that was in fact a true camera runoff. Some people are saying, no, no, it was earlier in the film, and they've edited the film, and they've taken out the bad stuff, and they did it, and this and that. There is no truth to any of that. The camera truly did run out at the end of the film while Roger was filming. We're running that Keep, way, right? It's okay, go ahead. Um, the, uh, one other thing that's curious that my research allowed me to indicate <coughs> is something, uh, there were, have been questions about the camera being used. It's reported that Roger used a K100 photo camera, and there have been people who time time and questioned it and something like that. So another area of my research was a curious thing about finding out about what are called camera identification num marks. And it turns out that manufacturers of 16 millimeter cameras, they each make a special mark, something like this or something like this, or dots or squares, triangles, triangle here, something like that. They make these marks and they put them in the aperture plate inside the camera so that what it does is that when you photograph the film, that little pattern will burn into the film. Next one, Greg. I'll show you an example right here. This is a standard 16 millimeter frame. This is just edge coating that the lab burned in before they made the film. But this triangle right here is actually allowing some of the picture, this scene of picture, to flow through that triangle. You would never see this when the film is projected. The film is projected, cropped off to here. But if you examine the camera original, you can identify exactly what kind of camera that filmed this thing because of that identification mark. Now, go on to the next one. This was a film test I did of a K100 camera. See the curious curvature up on the top there, right below the sprocket where it curves in? That is the camera identification mark of a Kodak K100 camera. It will always make that mark, but in projection you will never see it, and you usually will not see it in copying either, because copying usually masks that off. Next one. Now, when I was trying to imagine what would the camera original of the Patterson film actually look like, I did this suggestion that it might have a picture in that notch area. So this one is one that I reconstructed as a sample of what I expected to find if I could ever actually see the original itself or a photograph taken of the actual original film. Next. And lo and behold, when I had an opportunity to meet with Patricia Patterson in June, she showed me a 4x5 transparency that had been taken of the film, frame 352, and they photographed more than just the picture. They actually photographed more of the side of the film. This is the picture. There's the camera identification mark right up there in the corner. Here it is in large. Got a nice tree right in the middle of that little half moon shape. This is absolute conclusive proof that the camera that was being used by Roger was a Kodak K100 camera and not any other. Now I do realize that some of the things like camera identification marks and was it a runoff, that may not seem like the most exciting or glamorous of the research area. Some people might want something that's a little bit more exciting or lively in terms of what the research determines. But these are, in fact, very, very important foundation facts that help us establish with far greater credibility that the description of the filming, the events, and everything else by the two men who were there that day, the description itself is accurate. It also helps us that when we analyze the film, we have a much better idea of exactly what we were looking at. And this particular part of my research was an excellent indicator that allowed me to help determine the genealogy of various copies, because the film has been copied many times, and allows me to know how close to the original camera master any particular copy was, so I can grade it in terms of quality, 
the higher the quality, closer to the original, more detail it has, the more reliable it is for research purposes. So these are some important things that I have been doing as well. They're not related to the creature side of the business, but something that I seem to have capacity to do, I have an interest, and some of the elements that I needed for this analysis sort of fell into place, allowing me to do such.